Good morning, Covenant family and friends. It's the fourth Sunday of Lent, March 14th, 2021. I invite you to light your Christ candle because we are connected through the light of Christ and we are connected from home to home. So welcome to Covenant House Church. I'm also embracing the notion that this is now a year that we have been live streaming, love streaming together, even as we are apart. And as that day comes closer and closer, we come together with sad hearts, we come together with grateful hearts. We come together that no matter what, we give thanks for the journey, the journey of this past year, the journey of our past almost 101 years. And so this morning, I stand next to this deer path, emblematic of our shared journey over the tremendous challenges that the last year has brought and over all the challenges and celebrations that represent the almost 101 years we've had together as a faith community. Dear friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord be with you. Today, our participants include Jim, who will be our liturgist, Karen, who will be leading us in the blessing of our children. I will be presiding for the prayers of the people, again, emblematic of the steps of our journey together and Miriam will be sharing with us the word of the Lord. Let us worship God, dear friends. Please join me in the call to worship. Bless Yahweh, O my soul. Bless God's holy name, all that is within me. Bless Yahweh, O my soul. And remember God's faithfulness in healing of all your offenses, in healing of all your diseases, in redeeming your life from destruction, crowning you with love and compassion, in filling your years with good things, in renewing your youth like the eagles. Bless Yahweh, all angels, mighty in strength when forth God's word, attentive to every command. Bless Yahweh, all nations, servants who do God's will. Bless Yahweh, all creatures in every part of the world. Bless Yahweh, O my soul.
Company kids. Brought a couple pals along this morning. It's the month of March. Do you remember that last March we were all together at church? That was a whole year ago. We had March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, and here we are back in March. March is a month that starts out with the furious cold of winter, but ends with the gentle breezes of spring. Did you know that spring needed winter? Yeah. When winter was here, we needed the ground to be frozen for all of God's creatures that hibernate and for all of the fruit trees and the vegetables that grow underground and the flowers that will bloom in the spring. First winter, then spring, every time. Did you know that? There are a lot of things in this world that remind us of life. Like not just the life of a lion and a lamb or the lion and the lamb weather, but lion and lamb feelings. Sometimes do you feel ferocious and sometimes you feel gentle. We need all of those parts to be whole, just like the seasons of the year. Now this month is a season with winter and spring. They're not quite the same, just like our days are not quite the same either. Some days we might have lots of energy and lots of fun and silly ideas, and then other days we might not feel so excited. We're not bummed out. We just feel mm, a bit of the doldrums, you might say. Well, when you have a day like that, don't forget, spring's coming. You'll feel better tomorrow, for sure, for sure. All of the seasons and all of our feelings are needed to make us whole and complete, just like a whole year needs four seasons. Summer, fall, winter, spring. Did you notice that we never have summer and then winter, we always have fall in between. That's the thing you can count on in this world, that some things change a lot like the weather and our feelings, but in God's good plans for us, there's always a pattern we can count on. The seasons will always stay in order when there's just enough winter, it will be spring every time. And when you are feeling kind of down, don't worry, you'll feel better tomorrow. God's love stays the same in the winter, in the spring. Everything's under control. And I love you very much. And I would sure love to see a new picture of you so I can see how you have grown in this whole year since I last saw you. Spring is coming. Winter is passing us by. And you are a precious child of God, loved all the time through all the seasons and all of your feelings. Hope you'll have a wonderful day and go out tomorrow to be wonderful and pass it on. Bye for now. Karen, thank you so much. Thank you again for blessing our children of all ages. And now, dear children, we want to conclude this with our song. You are God's beloved children, with you God is well pleased. 
You are God's beloved children. With you, God is well pleased. Kids, thank you for sharing this journey with us. We love you. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Almighty God, you have set before us the path, but we have wandered on our own to try to find our way. Sometimes you are like toddlers and we hear your call and come back. Other times you are children testing boundaries, ignoring your call until fear finally makes us look back. And still other times we are full of youthful rebellion, demanding to be cut loose and set free, not knowing how much we still need to seek your wisdom and guidance. But most of all, too often we think we are adults and have figured it all out and know our own way, only to stumble and stray so far. Remind us, parental God, that we are always your children, that we are never fully grown up in your sight, that we always have much to learn. Help us to seek you every day, to acknowledge that we need your wisdom and guidance, and help us to return to the path and walk with you. In the name of Christ, who is our companion on this journey of faith, we pray. Amen. Hear also these words of assurance. Friends of God, believe this. God loved the world. God loves the world. We are the beloved. May the truth of this great love story shine through our worship today and renew our sense of calling. So come with your tiredness, your frustrations, and your discouragements. Come with your doubts, your fears, and your longings. Come to discover yet again how Jesus reveals God's love and mercy. Come in friendship to God and to each other, and to friendship to the world, to listen for God's word to us, to offer our prayers, and to renew our calling. And hear this guide for faithful living. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love.
I'm Dan, Chairperson of the Deacons here at Covenant. Please pray with me. In the offering of our gift, as well as in the living of our days, we may not grow weary of doing what is right, but commit to speaking up for the voiceless, healing the broken, feeding the hungry, and all those mercies which are such a part of your heart and hopes for your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, our prayers of the people this day are about steps, footsteps. Dear steps, but all the steps that we've taken in this last year, all the steps we've taken in the course of our lives, all the steps that we've taken together as a faith community, steps we've taken together as a family and in deep and abiding friendships. We will, uh, we will conclude uh, the prayers of the people uh, with the chorus from that great African-American spiritual, Order My Steps. Let's pray together. Secure our steps, O God, on rough terrain, on shifting sands, on fine wide roads, on narrow paths. Make our footsteps firm. Secure our steps, O oh God, in the boardroom, in the break room, in the schoolyard, in the checkout line. Make our footsteps firm. Secure our steps, O oh God, chasing after deadlines, trailing after toddlers, scrambling toward the finish line, clamoring for security. Make our footsteps firm. Secure our steps, O oh God, pacing through hospitals, wandering through the hurt, tripping over the unforeseen, wandering through grief. Make our footsteps firm. Amen. Dear friends, Miriam will be leading us in the reading and reflection on God's Word this day. Let's prepare our hearts by singing the prayer for illumination together. Take, O oh, take me as I am, summon out what I shall be, set your seal upon my heart, and live in me. 
Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> Journey. We're going to do a little journey here this morning. Journey is a favorite word here at Covenant. As Mark alluded to earlier, while standing by the deer path behind our home. We use the notion of journey for the story of our shared history. And we, ref we frame our ministry as the journey inward, the journey outward, and journey towards community. Uh, and in the season of Lent, we reflect on the journey of Jesus towards Jerusalem and his passion and, and the journey towards Easter. Our lectionary passages, all of them, invite us today to go from the Hebrew scriptures to uh, the gospel and then to the epistle lesson. It's a biblical journey through different time periods of biblical history. And like most journeys, there's a few surprises, uh, some twists and some changes in perspectives. And so it is with our own spiritual journey. So I love these interesting Bible stories as they continue to challenge me uh, to grow in my journey of faith. So let's wonder about these passages together. In the Hebrew scriptures, sometimes we refer to as the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, which I don't think is probably a, necessarily a favorite book of everybody, in the book of Numbers, we find a very bizarre story or a text of terror, as scholar um, Phyllis Tickle might name it. But listen to this story. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt into this wilderness? There's no food. There's no water. We detest this miserable stuff, this food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord listened. The Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent and live. Hmm. That's the bizarre story. A story of mm, human sin, divine salvation, uh, and I wonder about this story. What sort of God is this? The story is the Hebrew people have long since left Egypt. They're on a journey, a journey to a promised land. And in this story, they've just buried Aaron, Moses' brother, on Mount Hur. And they're trying to get to that promised land. And they've been wandering already now for a very long time, and they're weary and they're homeless. I would complain too, I think. How many times have you heard, when are we going to get there? And then those Edomites who live in the land of Edom, they won't allow passage through their territory. And so the journey has to be even longer. So I wonder about this story. Does complaining result in the Yahweh God smiting them with, with poisonous snakes, of all things? Do you wonder about God doing that? I, I do. 
And then God, this Yahweh God, this God of Moses says to him, make a snake and put it on a pole. And when people who are bitten look at it, they will be saved. Well, so here's a photo from a French artist named James Tissa. There's Moses. And there's the people kind of bowing down almost to this pole with a bronze snake on it. Uh, this is a little weird to me, a bizarre story. Does that sound like a, a god that you would be devoted to, that I would be devoted to? In that sense, who puts a snake on a pole for healing? Well, I, I wondered that, and so I had to go and, and look a few things up. And I learned that in ancient times, um, <laughs> there were many cultures and times where there were snakes on a pole that suggested power and healing, like, like in Egypt. Seen this before. Or there's the Greek and the Roman gods of Mercury and Hermes. Yeah, there's a snake on a pole. Two snakes on a pole. And here's Asclepius, the god of medicine, whose rod is even used today as a medical symbol. Huh. Of healing. So I, I wonder about these notions. I, I wonder, I wonder. When I was younger, I believe the story that taught that God punishes people for complaining. Complaining is a big sin. You're not supposed to complain. And if you don't trust God, even in times of difficulty, then God might get angry and might send punishment to teach you a lesson that that God sometimes sends harsh things. Ouch. Hmm. My spiritual and journey invites me into a little bit of a different notion of God, uh, who's not so, so much into punishment and is to be feared, um, but my journey has brought me more to the source of uh, an everlasting, steadfast, loving God. Early in Israel's history and their journey, there was an unknowing about this Moses God who they didn't know whose name he was, and he, he was a scary God. As time went on and over the generations that came along the way into the promised land and, and in years to come, those Hebrews who became known as the Israelites and then later on as the Jews came to experience and know God in a deeper and broader and fuller way. And so we go to the lectionary passage of Psalm 107, which is the Psalm of the day. And in that Psalm, it's kind of a great recitation, recitation of the saving power of God. The psalmist recalls the stories of struggling wanderers and prisoners and merchants and sailors. This is how the beginning of the psalm goes. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good and God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those who God redeemed from trouble and gathered from east and west and north and south. And then it tells about those who, some of them wandered and some sat in darkness and gloom and some, <laughs> Some were imprisoned. And here in verse 17, it says, some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction and loathed any kind of food. And they drew near to the gates of death. It's kind of reminiscent of this story in Numbers about the snakes. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress and sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. So let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love and his wonderful works to humankind. Huh. The psalmist 
recalls that they cried out to Yahweh God who heard and who saved them. And it seems to me that there's a kind of a shift in the story where the psalmist doesn't seem to imply that Yahweh sent the hardship, but is celebrating the saving power of God more than a notion of a punishing scary God. Give thanks to the Lord who is good, whose steadfast love endures forever. Well, then the lectionary would have us go to the Gospel of John. Today's passage from the third chapter. It's part of the story of Nicodemus who secretly visits Jesus at night because he really doesn't want his fellow party members, the Pharisees, to see him being friendly with someone on the other side of the aisle. In this chapter, we find probably the most famous verse of the Bible. So Jesus and Nicodemus have been talking about being born again and um, entering your mother's womb again and some questions and wondering. Nicodemus is on a journey of faith and is wondering. And then Jesus has these words, according to John's memory, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have life. And then this most famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave the only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, may not die, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And, and then that passage goes on a little bit more about those who believe and those who don't believe and who is condemned and who is not condemned and who is light and who is dark. And it's kind of an either or perspective, but I, I'd like to think about and wonder about and zero in on those first couple verses where it seems that Jesus is saying, like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him will have life. What do you suppose that means? To put it kind of roughly, is, is Jesus implying that he's like a snake on Moses' pole, hung up and killed so people will live? I admit that that notion causes me to squirm a bit. So I wonder, does God send punishment in the form of snakes or any other scary things in life to complainers or doubters? Is that who God is? Does God send a beloved son to kill him because someone has to pay for sin in the world? I struggle with these questions. Does God's justice demand that somebody's got to pay, somebody's got to die? What sort of God is the God of Jesus? These beloved words of Jesus, most quoted Bible verse of all time, for God so loved. God so loved the world. God loved the world so much, so much, so much, so much, so much that God sent Jesus not to condemn, but to save, to restore. God loved. It seems to me that if there's a message from Jesus that I, I'd like to believe that he invited us in our own faith journey to broaden our perspective of who and how and what God is. This notion of steadfast love that the psalmist sings about. God so loved steadfastly the world, the whole cosmos, 
everyone and everything in it. Jesus invites, I believe, his followers and his listeners to know a God of, of inclusion, we say, a God of mercy, a God of steadfast love, a God of grace. And so as the journey of faith believers continued on, and we have those early church writers who follow in this broadening perspective, we read in Ephesians today, in the second chapter, God who is rich in mercy, out of great love with which God has loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. Because, because by grace we are saved. I love the Bible stories. And I'm glad that I don't have to find a snake on a pole to save me from my complaining because I've got a lot of complaining. I want to affirm that as John writes in his letter, God is love. And nothing, as Paul writes in one of his letters, nothing can separate us from that love. And so in the evolving spiritual journey that winds through scripture and winds through our corporate story and and that spiritual journey that winds through me invites invites us all to an unfolding more and more i believe to trust in the way of god who is love so may love god who is love Continue to guide all of our pathways and all of our journeys, all of our days. May love be the way. Amen.
Dear friends, may you be at peace. May your heart remain open to the journey. May you always be more and more awakened to the light that is within you and is in your true nature. May you be healed of all that is at dis-ease within you. And may you be a healing presence as light and love and peace flow through you in all ways for all of the world. Amen. In the name of the Creator, and the Christ, and the Comforter. Amen. Go in peace.